He is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia. Welcome to our service from Trinity Lutheran Church in Broken Arrow. I'm Pastor David Clater. This is the second Sunday of Easter. You may access a printed copy of today's worship service with the hymns printed out if you go to our church's website, tlcba.org, and click on Worship Bulletins, and you can print off a copy of the service and follow along. In today's service, our intro is the totality of Psalm 133, which is just three verses. Our gospel lesson takes us to late afternoon on the day of Jesus' resurrection. Our epistle lesson skips forward 50 days to the day of Pentecost and the end of Peter's great Pentecost sermon. And uh, during this time that people are still concerned about the coronavirus, it's interesting to listen to Peter's word in our epistle lesson where he says, All flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flowers of grass. The grass withers, and the flower fails, but the word of the Lord remains forever. If you are able, we invite you to stand for our three Easter hymns, as well as for the Gospel lesson and for the Apostles' Creed. And if you are able, I also invite you to kneel during the confession of sins. We begin our worship service by singing, <clears throat> excuse me, hymn number 477, Alleluia, Alleluia, Hearts to Heaven. of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made, who made heaven, heaven and, and earth. earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and, and you, you forgave, forgave the, iniquity the iniquity of my, of my sin. sin. We silently confess our sins to God. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace, for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, O most, most merciful God, God who has, has given your only begotten, begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, 
and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy on us and has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives power to become the children of God, and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, to us all. Amen. Amen. Our intro today from Psalm 133. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. be to the Father, and and to the the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. We praise Thee, we bless Thee, we worship Thee. We glorify Thee, give thanks thanks to Thee thee for Thy great glory. O Lord God, Heavenly King, God the Father Almighty, O Lord, the the only only begotten Son, Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For Thou only art holy, Thou only art the Lord. Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit, let us pray. O God, through the humiliation of your Son, you raised up the fallen world. Grant to your faithful people, rescued from the peril of everlasting death, perpetual gladness and eternal joys. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our first reading is from Acts chapter 2, the end of Peter's sermon on Pentecost. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? 
And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. We say the gradual together. Christ, Christ has, has risen, risen from, from the, the dead. dead. God, God the, the Father, Father has, has crowned him with glory and honor. honor. He, has he has given him dominion over the works of his hands. hands. He, he has, has put, put all, all things under his feet. feet. The epistle lesson comes from Peter's first letter in chapter 1. If you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sake, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Easter afternoon. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you were holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going, he acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. 
So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us when he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to Thee, O Christ. We confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our next hymn is number 486, If Christ Had Not Been Raised From Death. from death, our faith would be in vain. Our preaching but a waste of breath, our sin and guilt remain. But now the Lord is risen indeed, He rules in earth and hell. His gospel meets a world of need, in Christ we are Still lay within the tomb, then death would be the end. And we should face our final doom with neither guide nor friend. But now the Savior is raised up, so when a Christian dies, we mourn yet look. Saints arise. If Christ had not been truly raised, his church would live a lie. His name should never more be praised, his words deserved to die. But now a great Redeemer lives through him. His word endures, His church revives, in Christ our risen Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In 1886, author Robert Louis Stevenson wrote a short fictional story of a called the, the Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It told about a London lawyer who investigated strange occurrences between an old friend, Dr. Henry Jekyll, and another man, Mr. Hyde. As it turned out, the good-natured Dr. Jekyll and the evil Mr. Hyde were in reality the same person. One individual with two personalities, one good and one evil. He had a rare mental condition called a split personality. When a person looks at the believers of Scripture, we find the same 
kind of split characteristics. For example, after the universal flood, uh, Noah built an altar to God, but right after that, he got drunk. When Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am, and who do you say that I am, uh, the apostle Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But moments later, he argued with the Lord Jesus, uh, one man doing two very drastically different things. When you look at your own life, you might notice this same split characteristics. At the end of the day, and you begin to think about what happened, you may say, boy, I really was a help to individuals and an honor to God, and you feel really good about yourself. And on the other hand, you look back and you say, boy, I, I did some things that were wrong. I, I had missed opportunities to do what was right. I had selfish thoughts. I, I uh, had evil desires in my heart. And chances are, at the end of the day, you might be patting yourself on the back and kicking yourself in the pants at the same time. Think of it this way. You have a bad day at work or at school or at home, and you're just frustrated with yourself because of the things that you've uh, done wrong. And you finally just shrug your shoulders and you go, oh. On the other hand, maybe you'll think of some things that you really did well, that honored God, and you'll go, ah, that felt so good to be like that. So today's sermon is really called The Two Sounds of the Christian Life. We are again, like last week, talking about the area of the Christian life we call sanctification. Or the Christian life of behavior once we come to know Jesus as our Savior. And that life is full of, oh, sadness and joy, ah, at the same time. Let's look at the sadness or the regret first. Paul says in Romans 7, beginning at verse 14, For we know that the law of God is spiritual, but I am flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For that which I am doing I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not wish to do, I agree with the law, confessing that it is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which indwells me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my sinful flesh. For the wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I wish, I do not do, but I practice the very evil I do not wish. But if I am doing the very thing I do not wish, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Now Paul says two things here. First, the good that he wants to do, he often does not do it. We call these sins of omission. You omit or fail to do the things that God wants you to do, such as pray, honor authorities, love your enemy, be considerate toward others. Paul says he wants to do what's right by God's law, but often he doesn't do it. He says, I'm not practicing what I would like to do, verse 15. Verse 18, the wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. In verse 19, the good that I wish, I do not do. On the flip side of the coin, he didn't always, he did things that he didn't want to do. We call these sins of commission, like lying or gossiping or lusting. He says, verse 15, I'm doing the very thing I hate. Verse 16, I do the very thing I do not want to do. Verse 19, I practice the very evil that I do not wish. In other words, the Christian constantly falls short of his good intentions. What then is the problem? Uh, the problem is not with the law of God. For Paul said, I agree with the law. He's talking about the moral law of God, confessing that it is good. So where is the problem? It's with his sinful flesh, his sinful nature. And this flesh is dangerously wicked. Paul wrote, 
For we know that the law is spiritual since it came from God, but I am unspiritual, sold into bondage to sin. Now, if you recall back in chapter 6, Paul talked about our baptism and the beginning of the life of sanctification in the Christian. And now, because we were connected to Christ in our baptism, sin no longer rules over us. It no longer has dominion over us. And yet, Paul says here that Christians are sold into bondage to sin. So there is a part in us that remains desperately wicked, even though we have come to know Jesus. In the Greek text, the word for this is sarx, which is translated in some translations flesh, not the skin of our flesh, but this sinful nature in us. Some translations render it simply the sinful nature. And this flesh is a stinking, rotten, wreaking havoc on our lives and hindering us from living the kind of life that God wants us to live. In further describing this sinful flesh, Paul says, I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. There was a document written back in 1577 called the Formula of Concord. It was written after, after the death of Martin Luther when there are a lot of questions about Bible teaching going on within the church. Uh, this document was meant to and did bring concord or harmony to the church at the time. In that document, it speaks about the third use of the law or the third purpose or function of God's moral law. The first purpose or function is a curb which checks the gross outbursts of sin in the world. It holds people in check, keeping them from being desperately wicked. God wrote his law in our hearts, and so people are hesitant to do what otherwise they would do. And so it's a good benefit to all of society. The second purpose of the law is that it works like a mirror, showing us our own sinfulness and a need for a Savior. The third use of the law is for the Christian, and it's a guide for how to live a holy life. In the discussion of this third use of the law, the law of God being used as a guide for the Christian in life, it speaks about our sinful flesh, and it calls the flesh an intractable, refractory ass. Now, you're not familiar with those words, but intractable means stubborn or obstinate. And refractory means headstrong. So our sinful flesh is like a stubborn, obstinate, headstrong donkey. And you can just picture one standing there or sitting there with its owner pulling the rope, which is around the donkey's head, tugging at it, but the donkey won't move even an inch. We're trying to gain an idea of the wickedness of our sinful flesh. We have to go to Galatians chapter 5, where Paul talks about the works or the deeds that our sinful flesh can produce. He said, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarned you that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. All sorts of evil things flow from the sinful flesh, and unless repented of, these will not bring a person into the kingdom of God. Now that's really disturbing because though we've been freed from the guilt and punishment of our sins, and chapter 6 told us even from the power of sin to rule over us, nevertheless we have this sinful flesh still hanging on inside of us. Paul speaks about the problem again in verse 20 and 21, where he says, sin dwells in me. And verse 21, evil is present in me. Think about how horrible that really is. Let's suppose you had extra room in your house and you decided to rent out a bedroom. 
And so there was a man, say, 30 years old, seemed to be a nice guy. You begin renting your bedroom out to him. And uh, several weeks later, an acquaintance tells you, oh, this man uh, was a <clears throat> had um, a predator, predator uh, sexual predator on people. And he was in the jail for the last couple years. And you'd go, oh, my what have we done? We've let this man into our house, and what, what's he going to do to my wife and to my children? And that's what the sinful flesh is like. It's evil, and it just wants to do evil things. So it's wicked and stubborn, and it will never be reformed. All you can do is beat it down with a stick. Because of the sinful flesh, all Christians are capable of thinking and saying and doing very wicked things. Noah got drunk. Abraham lied. Moses struck a rock when he was supposed to speak to it. Job fled. James and John sought places of honor. Peter argued with Jesus. And on and on and on. And these were believers. And because of the sinful flesh, there is no such thing as perfectionism on earth. No Christian is without sin. Now, we're not trying to excuse our sinfulness, not at all. There is no excuse, but we're just stating a fact. Likewise, you will never find a perfect husband or a perfect wife. And as hard as you try, and you should, you will never have perfect children and you'll never be a perfect parent. You'll never find a perfect church and a perfect pastor, nor you as a member of a congregation will be perfect. Have you ever met someone who never admits that they've done anything wrong? Perhaps you found that same inclination in your own self. Well, throw that thought out the window because it's just not true. Be a man be a woman, be real. You and I have a sinful flesh. Because Paul was a Christian, he wanted to do what was right, but his sinful flesh got in the way. Listen to what he says in verses 21 to 23. I find then that the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wishes to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Paul wanted to do what was right, but this rotten, sinful flesh inhibited him. It was waging war against his new man, the inner man. There was once a woman who paid several visits to a counselor, a Christian counselor. After several meetings, she expressed her frustration, and she asked, What is wrong with me? The counselor stroked his chin for a second and then said, If you want my opinion, I'd say you're allergic to yourself. If there's one person you ought to stay away from, it's you. And that's the problem with us. Inside of us, we have a sinful flesh. And so what do we do? We, we sigh. We go, oh my, that's so bad. Now, it's clear that Paul was not happy at all with his sinful nature. He said that he wanted to do what is right and hated to do what was wrong. But I'm up against this sinful flesh, he said. He said, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? How did Paul react to his sinful flesh? He had a repentant heart. He groaned. He regretted it. He moaned. He wished to be rescued from it. And this is very, very important. For the person who's comfortable with his sins is no Christian at all. Back in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, there was a notable Christian theologian by the name of Francis Pieper, and he wrote this about the Christian life, which we call sanctification. He said, the fact that sanctification in this life will always be imperfect 
must not be put forward as an excuse for the neglect of sanctification. On the contrary, it is God's will and the will of the Christian that he strive after perfection. He wants to be fruitful, not only in some, but in all good works. It is characteristic of the true Christian life that the will and the will of the new man that he refrain from every sin. The Christian is eager to serve God in all good works. Paul wrote in Romans 7, I delight in the law of God after the inner man. The Christian who does not strive to serve God alone is perilously close to losing his Christianity. So we should not think about our sinful flesh or our sins in general as being trivial or harmless. Certainly Paul did not have that feeling when he wrote, Wretched man that I am. And to this he asked the question, Who will set me free from the body of this death? And by asking that question, he showed that he could not free himself from this condition. He had to look to God for deliverance. But by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul was able to give the answer to his own question. He said, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our only hope is in Jesus Christ. This is the Jesus whom Paul had been talking about back in chapters 4 and 5. In chapter 5 he wrote, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in this, While we were still sinners, Christ died for us much more than having now been justified or forgiven by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. A little bit later in chapter 8, Paul then wrote, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So it is the sound of the Christian. It's, ah, it's one of relief. I have a Savior in Jesus Christ. To save us, Jesus took the guilt and punishment of our sins upon himself, and he died on the cross. And then he rose from the dead, and God the Father declared now that all of the sins of the world have been forgiven. And that moves us to say with the Apostle Paul, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for delivering me even of my sinful flesh. And help me now to fight against the flesh in my life. So we are comforted by the fact that Christ died for all of our sins. But we are also comforted by the fact that we are in the battle against the sinful flesh. From this text, we get a clear picture of what a Christian really is like. He's one who is concerned about the laws of God. He wants to keep the laws of God. He does not want to sin. He wants to do what God commands of him. And when he does sin, he's ready to confess them like the Apostle Paul and say, wretched man that I am, and seek forgiveness in Jesus Christ. The first president of our church body, C.F.W. Walther, wrote, Paul says plainly, sin will have no dominion over you. If I am a Christian, sin is like a robber, <clears throat> a robber, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> a robber may attack me, <clears throat> excuse me, but I will not act toward it as, <clears throat> excuse me, but I will not act toward it as toward my king. I will not act toward it as toward my king. To him, my king, I give what he demands. The robber's bidding, however, I will not do, but will seek to escape him. I will even draw my pistol and say, Now come, I do not consider my life so precious, but I am in a self-defense situation, and dare not let every street thief have his way. Whoever does not stand against sin as against a robber, but treats it like, treats it like his government or ruler, he is no Christian. The fight between the flesh and the spirit is the real mark of the true 
Christian. And so I ask you, are you fighting against sin or have you surrendered to it? Are you in the battle? That is the mark of a Christian. So our chief comfort, because of our sinful flesh, is that we have a Savior in Jesus. And our second comfort is that we are in the battle, which is the mark of a Christian. But Paul also gives us several other things to rejoice in, and that is that God gives us some tools to battle against the sinful flesh. Our sinful flesh is sometimes called the old man in us, but when we became Christians, the God created in us a new nature, which is called the new man, sometimes referred to as the Spirit with a small s, as opposed to the Holy Spirit with a capital S. And this new man, this Spirit in us, desires to do the will of God. Paul referred to this new nature when he said, I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. And this new man fights against the desires of the flesh. But not only do we have this new man in us, God, the Holy Spirit, also has come into our lives. When we became Christians and when we were baptized, the Holy Spirit came into our hearts and into our lives and even into our bodies, the Bible says, and he lives there and he begins to clean us up. Again, in Galatians chapter 5, Paul spoke not only of the works of the flesh, but of the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit which the Holy Spirit produces in us, he says, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and the like. Have you ever seen that colorful call, car called, with the letters on it, Merry Maids? Uh, these are people who come in and clean your house. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He comes in and he cleans up our lives. So he gives us the Holy Spirit and this new man in us. And he motiv also motivates us when we hear the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ. That's why Paul said, thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Later on, in talking about the life of sanctification in chapter 12, Paul said, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. He urged them by the mercies of God, reminds them of the mercies of God, the forgiveness of sins we have in Christ. And because when we hear that our sins are forgiven, we want to do what God uh, has told us to do. And we want to avoid what is sin. We can be like the Apostle Paul and struggle against that sin. Paul concluded with this summary. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other hand, with my flesh, the law of sin. And this struggle between the old man and the new man will go on until we die or until Christ comes again. And then we will be set free forever from the old sinful flesh. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the new man and the sinful flesh, at the same time. And that's why the Christian has two sounds. Oh, and ah. Moaning and rejoicing at the same time. God, we thank you that you've rescued us from our sinful flesh through our Savior, Jesus Christ. By the power of your Spirit, help us always to battle against our flesh. Amen. And now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Take not thy hold.
Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Amen. We bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your protection from the coronavirus, and we ask that you would strengthen us and all people in our community, our country and world, as we and they may be exposed to it. You are the great preserver of life, and we place our well-being into your hands. Give health to Jennifer Morgan, Judith Wessels, Bill Knapp, Frida Burton, Catherine Shin, Tom Rogers, Bill Barrett, Tina Stutzman, Marion Knight, <clears throat> Elaine Hellkamp, Mark Freihout, and others we mention in our hearts. Give our state and national leaders wisdom to apply appropriate measures for our safety and allow businesses to begin to open up and let workers return to their jobs. Provide for the financial needs of our members and citizens. Bless the Osborne family as they now are in Illinois. Allow his work to begin there and guide them to a faithful congregation for worship. We thank you for protecting us from severe weather, and we pray for your protection throughout this spring. Bless all farmers with conditions that make for successful planting and growing of their crops. May your blessing be upon those celebrating birthdays, Hillary Kennedy, Janice Wingfield, and John Picar. Bless Gary and Jillian Cooper as they celebrate their 20th wedding anniversary. Give them good physical health and move them to grow in your word. Bless the work of our church's seminaries and universities, as well as all Lutheran and Christian schools across our country, that your word may be faithfully proclaimed and professional church workers and strong lay leaders may be provided for our congregations. Bless the Beckendorfs in Botswana and may their work of translating your work for the Quay people continue to progress. Give them will willing workers also that are needed for their work. Bless the work of Reverend Edward Nauman in Sri Lanka and give him the wisdom and strength to carry out his work of training pastors. Make us all missionaries of your word to the people around us. According to your will, allow us to return to regular worship services in the near future. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Bless we the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. 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 We now sing hymn 457, Jesus Christ is Risen Today. Christ is risen today, Alleluia. Our triumphant holy day, Alleluia. Who did once upon the cross, Alleluia, suffer to our loss, Alleluia. But the pains which he endured, Alleluia, 
our salvation have procured. Alleluia. Now above the sky is king. Alleluia. Where the angels ever sing. Alleluia. Sing we to our God above. Alleluia. Praise eternal as his love. Alleluia. Praise him, all ye heavenly hosts. Alleluia. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Alleluia. He is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia.